Welcome to Share.Care, an all-inclusive community sharing experience, strength, and hope to create strong, healthy, and inspiring relationships. Share.Care communities work toward every individual feeling safe, valued, and heard, free from the threat of danger, pain, or harm. Each episode, founder Damian Andrews explores the principles underpinning Share.Care and invites expert special guests to share their knowledge so you can easily reap the benefits so many others experience. You hold the choice to create your future. Let it be with strong, healthy, and inspiring relationships. Hello and welcome to the Share.Care podcast. Our belief is that global peace starts at home. Feeling safe, valued and heard gives you a foundation to confidently step out and make the world a happier and safer place for everyone. Because in today's world, it's in your own selfish best interest to help others. Now today we have Julian Roberts as our special guest. Julian is a high performance coach who works with leaders, athletes and teams with extreme ambitions. He's a master at co-creating what may seem to others as like impossible or unrealistic goals. Plus, he's also the host of the Helping Organisations Thrive podcast. Welcome, Julian. Uh, Good to see you, Damien, and thank you for inviting me today. I'm looking forward to this conversation. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. Would Would you like to start with a bit of your background and some of the challenges that you've faced that led you to do what you're doing now? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I spent 20 years uh, sort of post sort of my degree in sort of the food industry um, and uh, successful career, enjoyed the career. I was in sales and uh, managed lots of uh, sales teams and thoroughly enjoyed it, loved exciting targets, profit targets, sales targets, and really sort of um, um doing the business stuff and doing lots of strategy stuff um but it, it came to a bit of a head probably I was about six years ago now so i've been my my own sort of coaching practice for the last five and a half years where i was in an organization uh that was um i would say was probably my first toxic organization um it's interesting people talk about toxic organizations <laughs> and you sort of don't really understand it until you're in one um and but I, I look on it, it, it gave me the impetus because it was it, it was challenging, wasn't very um, life-giving, um, <laughs> nature of being toxic, and I didn't really enjoy it. Um, but it started to make me think, and because I started to lose my, my sort of vibe for what I was doing, it's almost knocked it out of me. Um, but at the same time, which was interesting, my wife and I were looking to uh, foster a child as well. So we had the sort of two things almost, say, colliding or coming together and, and created, a, I would say, a perfect opportunity because with the challenge of the toxicity, as much as it was difficult for a number of years, it made me think about what I really want to do. Then we think about fostering. And I think, in, actually, I want to have some more freedom or flexibility so I can really do the fostering well. And my wife is going to be the one who's the main carer um, but I wanted to support her and, and be quite heavily involved. Um, and so I, it's interesting. I, I started to think about my career and what I enjoyed as much as I enjoyed all the, the sales side and, and delivering the targets and developing strategies for new areas and new entry into markets. Um, it was the thing that really got me was actually working with my teams and working with individuals and actually taking individuals and seeing them uh, tapping into their potential and unlocking that potential and seeing them fly uh, was more rewarding than anything else. Uh, just getting alongside them, coaching them, advising them, uh, sometimes challenging them, uh, but getting to a place where they really just took off. And that's what got me. And I thought, actually, that's what I really want to do. That, that, that's, 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 that's me, really. And that's what really gets me excited. And that's what I loved about managing teams. Um, so I, I jumped ship um, <laughs> um, almost before I probably was even pushed, I guess. Who knows? So, uh, so I, I, I jumped the corporate ship. I relate like um, to being pushed, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> into, a, into the scary world of being on my own. And, um, but it, it, it was with a bit of a purpose and a purpose of wanting to get excited about, you know, fostering a child, but also developing a new career that would sort of um, give me more flexibility and freedom but also I think resonate 
far more with my purpose, uh, with what I love doing is unlocking leadership potential. Um, and so I kicked off with initially consulting uh, people and, and businesses on sort of strategy. I used my, sort of my background. And in the interim of that, I then retrained uh, as an executive coach and start to learn some of the skills and the techniques and got the experience. And, uh, and that's what I do now. And I, I work with say, executives, I work with emerging leaders, teams, uh, whether you're in an organization or with athletes. Um, and I absolutely love it. And I almost, I'm thankful that I went through that toxic environment. I'm thankful for the the impetus, the, the thing that gave me focus, because things like that make you focus on what really matters uh, and created the, I guess, the opportunity. Uh, and that's not just been very, you know, cliche. It genuinely was something that gave me that push that I needed and almost a stepping stone to something that was the, what I love doing and the freedom I have and how I do it. And so for you, was it a case of the similar sort of thing? You're in a toxic environment. You've worked in sales, which I would imagine is very goal orientated. Well, I know it is very goal orientated from having worked in sales myself. Um, do you, does that like did those skills translate into you moving out and what what sort of challenges did you have to to starting up yourself because i imagine there's a lot of people that would be in a toxic environment that want to make the jump that maybe they're a bit scared to so that might seem like an impossible goal to them what advice would you give to some people in in that kind of environment to to take that leap or what would they need to do to take those steps yeah and and there was challenges and and it, and you know Jumping from you know being salaried, looked after, healthcare, everything else to none of that and inconsistency you know, sort of financially, uh, there is some challenges that come with it. Uh, so you know you're not to take these sort of things um, without some real um, thinking about it and, and insights. Um, I think for me, the, the advice I, I would give myself, I guess, if I was going back there, is, is getting that clarity of, of, of my purpose. And it was that that was the bit that I hold on to, really. Um, it wasn't just about running away, because I don't believe you should run away from things. I think you should go towards something. Um, and because I think running away has that image of you looking behind. And when you're looking behind running, you tend to fall over. Um, <laughs> and, it, and it's not really helpful. I know it's a very bad metaphor and analogy, but... That's, that's a great analogy. I think it's very clear. <laughs> when <laughs> so, you're running towards something, it, it's like clear. You know, whether you run to a, a finishing line, you can see it in sight and you can just go for it. Um, and so for me, it's... And I, and I do talk with executives who are doing transitions, and that's not just transition out of corporate, but transition into a new role or into um, you know greater opportunities in their business. Is you know, and and is to go towards whether that's a, a purpose, mission, mission, vision, whatever you want to call it, but to get clarity on your purpose, on who you are, what you're about, what really excites you, what really resonates with you, because you know the people talk about your north star, your true north, however you want to term it. I always get to my clients that place because once you've got that, then everything else becomes a lot clearer. And then when things get thrown at you, uh, whether that's in the new area you're walking in or new territory, you then know, is this going to take me closer to my sort of true north or is it going to take me away? And it, just, it acts as a real guide and a real filter. Um, but what it also does is when you do get those challenges of, you know, inconsistent sort of income, people letting it down, whatever it may be, you know, economies, uh, all's going in crazy at the moment, certainly in the UK, um, it then makes you think, okay, my, my purpose still is valid. That's not changed. That's still valid. It's just the how and the the timing has changed. And I remember talking to a, a CEO you know, at the time of COVID when that happened. I mean, that was an absolute shock to all of us. And I remember talking to a number of CEOs who were linking what on earth's going on? And nobody knew how to navigate it. Nobody knew what, what was going to happen. And, and I remember talking to CEO and I said, well, does your purpose of your company, your mission change because of COVID? And he said, well, broadly, it doesn't change. Um, well, then take that. But the how and the timing has changed. That, that's reality. That's where you are now. Use that purpose. Galvanize your teams. Use it as an energy source. Use it as a way to inspire people. And you've got this big thing called COVID in the way at the moment. Um, just look beyond it uh, with your purpose and start to think of how can I get around this? And it just creates opportunities. It creates ideas, solutions. Still means it's quite tough, but it gives you some way of navigating around it. And 
that really helped the CEO did, did the whole sort of thing with a team and they started to sort of create some ways of working, new services and start to navigate themselves out of it. Um, and, I, and again, that's how I would say to anybody individually, if you're making that jump or just being challenged anyway. Right. And so from your perspective, because you mentioned as you're making this jump from the toxic environment to your own business and consulting and, and that uncertainty that comes with that, certainly not, you know, with that income side of things is not consistent as it is with a salary. You also mentioned that you were looking at um, uh, adopting a child as well. Um, so that seems like two two things. And, and I imagine from what you're saying. Also fostering a child. Fostering. Oh, fostering, fostering, sorry. Yeah. Um, so with the, the fostering of the child, with I mean, because one of the things Cher has as its foundation is is home is the central place. It isn't forever um, your sanctuary is what we're talking about. And mm. from that, you know, from with the, the leadership principles that you teach, and you know, when you're working with leaders and athletes and teams, how much of that is relatable to you know operating in a home, like leading your children, um, those kind of things? How how does that are the principles the same from what you teach or is there a difference? Or uh, I think the principles are exactly the same. Um, whether you're dealing with a, an adult or a child, they are human beings and, yes, we're at different stages of life and, and your principles of how you, in the home or at work, wherever you are, should be consistent. Um, you know, I think people have this almost different, way of working at home versus um work a i think it is incongruent to who you are but also it must create a huge amount of stress in you how do you manage that how do you work through so i believe you can you should be the same in the context obviously situationally context i'm not saying you know you wouldn't be hugging everybody in the work context but obviously you would at home but i'm talking about being appropriate in that sense um but but totally um i mean it's interesting my, my my purpose is about unlocking leadership potential but i mean that's one of the one of my drivers for becoming fostering not that we're saviors to a child but we're there to help unlock potential and enable and facilitate that potential and give an opportunity to somebody perhaps they've not had and that, that's how i deem it and that helps us get through those difficult times because we've been doing it three and a half years now and it is difficult at times. It's what well, it's it's really hard, and it's not to be taken a step into lightly. Um, but I would certainly use all the principles. And it's interesting. The other day I was at a at an event, and I was asked about um, actually we talked talking about parenting. Actually, because it's interesting. Talk about leadership. You ended up talking about parenting, and and they asked about what would be your thing advice and i'd say my big advice with anything in parenting which i think it relates to leadership is to when you're with somebody is to be fully present just like you and i now are completely distracted of what else is around us and anybody's trying to call us email us we're fully present fully uh, immerse ourselves in that conversation and i learned not when i was uh, a younger dad but certainly like latterly is to be absolutely fully present with my children and to be there to listen, to support, and just listen sometimes. Don't even say anything because often people know what the if they've got a problem or work it out themselves just by the conversation. Uh, and if they feel heard, they'll feel valued and they'll feel supported in that. And so I, um, I've really adopted that approach with my children, but I also did, did that in leadership. And I think it's an important, valuable uh, thing to be doing in as leaders is to just be fully present don't look at the what's next on your agenda don't think about um what you're going to be doing tomorrow or even the next meeting actually just immerse yourself and people will feel that and know that feel valued and they'll give you a lot more uh, and do far more listening and listening you know it's it's incredible really i, I remember talking to my daughter this was probably uh yeah two years ago she just finished her sort of high school sort of uh, level um and she no sorry she was going into her second year of high school level where she had to sort of do her exams at the end and, and at the start of it so at the end of the summer the start of the, the new sort of term and she was I could have gone to her and said well now you need to pull your socks up and you need to work hard it's all about this year you've got to do really well all that and tell her what to do and and that's just a just doesn't work anyway because nobody has been told and i just went for a walk with her we just had a conversation and i hardly spoke 
And I just said, oh, how's, 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 this, week, how's this year going to be, do you think? And she started sharing her thoughts. And then she just started to go into, well, this is what I'm going to do. And she came up with like three, four action points of ways of working that she's going to do in terms of extra work, reading, watching YouTube videos, whatever it may be. There's a little plan. And at the end of it, it was interesting. You know, I hardly said anything. She said, Dad, have you been, have you been coaching me in that time? Because she has this. So I, said, I said, I've just been asking questions. And, and she spoke and talked and she came up with this plan herself, completely on her own, completely motivated. And she went off and did it. And it's that power of listening enables those sort of, I guess, um, I guess you call it results. I'm not that I saw it as a result, but enables those that empowerment to really happen. And so, yeah, that's, and, I, and, that, and that would be the same context in a leadership point of view as well. So for someone to, to listen, because it's very common uh, that people, when someone's talking, you'll be immediately thinking about what to say next. And, and I'm, I'm guilty of this now. As, as I'm listening to you, I'm starting to think, okay, what questions can I ask you next? No, I, I, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's one of those things where we, I mean, it's very common, and I know I used to do it a lot as well, is when someone's talking, I'm immediately thinking of what to say next. What, what would you, what advice would you give to someone to to actually train themselves out of that to listen? What what steps could they take to so that they can just be more actively listening? Yeah, I mean, there's there's, there's loads out there on the whole listening piece. Uh, I think for me, it's it all starts, and it's not about you know here's the three four steps how to do it because that the, you can go online and probably help you to find you do that. For me, it starts with. Um, setting your intent and setting what you're going to do in this conversation. You know, I'm, I'm intending, and I'm sure you are as well, uh, to listen to you, to engage with you, and to have a good conversation. That's my intent this morning, and, and I'm sure you're similar. And it's fine you're looking and making notes. That, that, that's okay. That's, that's, I know you, you've, got, you've got to do that because you could, I'll ramble along and you've got to ask me questions. Um, but it, it's all about you know, when I in, engage, whether it's my child or, or somebody in a networking event or somebody in, in a work context, setting your in, intent to actually um, listen to this person what how can i help them how can i get alongside them how can i serve them how can i you know it's and, and really understand what they're trying to say i think that's where it, it starts and then it comes with you know the next bit is all about being fully present and fully immerse yourself and and there's nothing wrong with writing notes if you're if somebody's talking to you and sharing with you i do this with my clients you know if i'm listening to a client share for five ten minutes sometimes I can't remember anything. And I and I pick out obviously bits of patterns and what they're saying. And I might just write a word down. I'm still listening, but I'm just writing a word down. I'm not thinking what I'm going to say next. What I'm doing is just making a note. Like you're probably making a few notes, which is fine. And that's okay. Um, and but if you're fully present and you just immerse yourself and you let them talk and let them um if they feel if they feel they're listened to, they'll feel more comfortable and they'll share more. And they'll feel feel incredibly valued. So to me, they're the, they're the two things. You know, set your intent right, um, and and that intent's not about all oh, what what can I get out of this. It's more about how can I help this individual when I'm engaging with them. And then the other one is you know be fully present. Uh, and if you do the two of those things, yes, there's the whole eye contact, body language, uh, those sort of factors we need to think about, making sure. Sometimes you repeat back to make sure you've heard something, everything else. But those sort of, we all know those ones. But I think two things, accept the intent right and be fully present. And you can't go far wrong with that. Yeah, that's pretty sage advice there. And, and I'm all about, you know, there's so many different complicated ways we can do things. And I think we overcomplicate it. But what you've just laid out there um, for the listeners to pay attention to is, is two key things that if you do that, you're really going to engage with one uh, people, which is you know, have the intent to listen and to um, to fully engage. You mentioned earlier uh, as you were talking about when we're talking about the, the difference between leadership at home and leadership at work, and if you're trying to be different, it'd be incongruent. I mean, you talk on your your website about the relationship between authentic leadership and team resilience. Do you want to explain a little bit about what that is and, and how that relates? You know, what is authentic leadership and what is team resilience? Because again, I I would suggest that relates both in a work environment as a as in a home environment as well. Like if you're a parent, there'd be a 
the, the leadership position and needed to be authentic. And as a as a family, you, you would be a team. So can you can you talk to to those two points, please? Yeah, sure. And 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 you've probably got that from I'm in the process of doing a, a thesis. I'm doing my masters in psychology, uh, and I'm actually I'm actually trying to understand is there a a correlation between authentic leadership and team resilience. So uh, I'm halfway through my analysis on that. Um, uh, my gut feel thinks there is, and there's Alan, but I'm, I'm trying to, I'm going to absolutely hone it a little bit more and what, what the impact is um, being by being authentic in terms of how that impacts team resilience. Because I think it's interesting team resilience or resilience in itself is that um, there's been lots of, talk certainly in the last number of years about sort of personal resilience and how we get through things and everything else and I think often people just think it's all about grit and determination and it's far from that uh, you know for me resilience about is yes there's the falling down and getting back up but before you get back up you know what did you learn from that aspect of things yeah. um, and there's also this little misnomer that you get a lot of individual resilient high resilient people together it will create a resilient team again that doesn't correlate um, you need to build team in the context of team uh, resilience uh, so that's important so that's one aspect so yes I'm, and I'm really the reason I, I, I focus on team resilience is that uh, I just think it's a, a factor that for sustainability and to manage the completely uncertain changing world we're in not just I'm just in COVID here. It's, it's always going to be like that. Uh, so you need to have resilience. Um, so yeah, with authentic leadership, um, I, I believe the reason that I mean authentic leadership. And there's obviously lots of definitions out there, but it's for me about mean. And it's not just about being yourself, and that's it. Simple as that. It's, it's far deeper than that. It's more about um, yes, being very self-aware. Yes, being. Uh, having that sort of internal moral compass which you uh, make it very transparent who you are and that your values uh, and you're more value driven and that's uh, what you say you do uh, as in you're not saying something and doing something completely else that, that's your authenticity um, but also is when you engage with people there's this um, almost they call it balanced processing where you take people's inputs it, because you don't feel that you need to know all the answers and and that you are the leader, therefore you've got to know everything and you've got to make the decision. Actually, you engage with people and get their inputs, their expertise, and you take a view and then you make a decision because you're a leader and you can make a decision, but you might base it on somebody else's inputs. Um, so that's, to me, authentic leadership. And I think the reason why, I guess, authentic leadership really sort of does impact team resilience, and I'll get more once I've done my thesis on this, is that it sort of um, helps people really um, become more empowered uh, as well. And I think empowerment is uh, a helpful tool and, and collaboration is a helpful tool uh, in developing those, all that sort of team resilience uh, within the context. Uh, but it's also, and I it's one of the building blocks I talk about in, in team resilience is this sort of psychological safety where people feel they can, you know, suggest new ideas they can challenge it respectfully uh, they can make a mistake and fail and, it, and it's it's okay as long as, as long as we're learning from it and they can push the boundaries because uh, i think if you're trying to navigate difficult situations you need to be able to think of new ways of working new ideas and you've got to feel comfortable with that because it makes you feel uncomfortable uh, but you've got to be comfortable as a team that it's psychologically safe to do that and i think authentic leadership um seems to uh enable that psychological safety better there's obviously ways of doing it but the, the style of leadership the empowering the transparency the openness the ability to be genuinely uh, honest as well so i think those, those sort of values really help with building a uh, sort of a psychologically safe team and i would imagine like this authentic leadership and having that team resilience because you what you work in um, is setting impossible or what seem like impossible and unrealistic goals and I would imagine from two aspects like from others if you're the team leader um, setting these goals that are up here you, there'd have to be some sort of you know strong 
authentic leadership and and resilience to be able to keep moving forward to that. But also, too, is is there a connection to your own resilience to go, okay, I can actually achieve that? How, How does someone go from not, you know, maybe not having set any realistic goals or any real goals to then going setting the impossible and unrealistic goals and then and keeping you know having that resilience to keep pushing forward how do you guide someone through that i think it comes a lot of it is people believing you in in you as well i mean a lot with my clients is you know i don't push people to a point of stretch that like it snaps it's it's i always believe some people slightly undercook themselves and as a bit of a defense mechanism bit of a and i and i try and you know through judgment with the clients uh i don't always get it right um ascertain that what that is and so i might sort of you know what you know had a client who was looking to build a business to 50 million in in 10 years which is from from almost zero is a, a sizable goal and we went through a process and it wasn't me i think you should do more it was a process that that started to open up ideas in, and inspiration so it wasn't done by me saying i think you should do more than that and pointing the finger and pushing it was more about just turning their eyes to other opportunities enlighten them more open their eyes a bit more and what happened they by themselves then went to 100 million and I was a little bit shocked myself, actually. I thought, okay, interesting. Um, and I challenged was that too much. As a, and and they came back and they completely then logically worked it through. And then yeah. that became the – and so it wasn't just me challenged, although I do challenge as well, but it was more about me just giving a different perspective that then opened up their eyes to actually there is far more. And I guess that's what I, I try and do. Um, and it's interesting, you know, we, we talk about goals and outcomes and the sort of they are important, but then in some ways they're not important. They, they sort of give you a bit of a direction. I think that's for me, it's more the direction piece. Um, and it's more the, the process of what you go through, because if you if you if you put your life on just outcomes and goals, then you can get very disappointed and uh, it, it's not always very motivating at times uh, or you get you hit a goal and you. Yeah, you're you're elated for a day. You've achieved it. Oh, what next? <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm not saying we shouldn't set things, but it, it's it's have a it goes back to the bigger picture, which is the purpose bit, more 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 life giving. Um, but to um, just get more in, involved in the the process, you know, the daily actions, daily executional stuff you're going to do that will get you towards it. Uh, that's what matters. It's more the process along the way. And in fact, often my clients come along with two or three goals they want to achieve. And by the end of it, they've achieved far more other stuff as well along the way that they didn't realize they, they were going to achieve. So it sounds like what you're actually doing when we're talking about impossible and unrealistic goals, goals is unlocking the potential that they didn't realize was inside them. Is that fair to say? Yeah. That would be fair to say, yeah. Yeah, and is that a difficult task to to get people to realise that they're capable, more, more capable of, or well, that they've got more capability than they give themselves credit for? It, it depends. Often it can be just the their experience. I think often we 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 are we we put goals based on our experience and our our um, current narratives. And what I try to do is change those narratives um uh, and also it could be they they want to achieve great things but they just feel there's a some sort of like a limiting belief that's stopping them so they don't go after it uh, and that's often the case they sort of know what they want to achieve uh, also they or they play it down to a sort of minimize it so they feel they'll hit it and achieve it uh, even though they want to achieve something more uh, but they're not entirely confident they'll achieve more because they don't have quite a belief about it uh, so we, we work on that uh, but I, I had a client once who was he kept having this and it was a bit of a mindset shift really it was interesting he had this mindset and I kept talking about certain stuff we were talking about and he said oh, I'll put that in my sort of three year five and five year plan I was like and he kept saying it all the time I was like I said well what do you do now he sort of and he went well I said was anything stopping you doing it right now he said well not really I said well do it then he went okay very simple little shift and little challenge a little shift of mindset 
and I, and I, I didn't think anything of it really. And then we finished our engagement a few weeks later, and then he um, he came back to me a few years later actually to do some sort of stuff with his team, and he said to me. He says that one thing you 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 did with me, and I think and I ever did more than one thing, but anyway, that, that's all that matters. Um, he says, I've done more in the last sort of 18 months than I have in the previous five years. And it just shifted and started to do something amazing for him that just unlocked it, just it created a new narrative. Uh, because you get caught up in our well, we've always done it that way, and we need to have some time, new narratives. And we and I as a as a coach, that's what I come and I challenge and help them re- rewrite or recreate uh, those um, new narratives. And okay, so you mentioned limiting beliefs that hold people back. Uh, have you come up with your clients? Is there like a common set of limiting beliefs that you've come across? And and if so, how have you helped them overcome those particular beliefs? I'm just wondering if you know the audience that's listening might have similar beliefs and and how they would overcome them. Yeah, I think a lot of them come from our experience and and often it can be something if somebody said something to you and it can be like you can't do that or you've never done that um or it could just be a, a self-talk of that so it's 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 a narrative and I, it, they vary in in forms but it, that's what happens where somebody says you know you, you you can never be a keynote speaker or you can never grow a business and double your business or whatever it may be uh, so it's more of a that's what's happened and it i say it's not always what somebody said to you it's just from your experience then you've just created the narrative in your head um and so so my role is then to challenge that narrative and to say a how do you know that b why is that the case and and then how do you then rewrite that narrative and what do you need to do to change it that actually you can be an owner of a 100 million pound business you've never done it before and because that's another thing is the unknown as in you've never done that before you know i've never owned a coaching practice before um and so there's you know i've never worked for myself before you know i've never a whole host of stuff i've never done before and so actually that's also sort of unlocking that sort of mindset of uh, opportunity with people so yeah that's it's just creating those new narratives bringing some challenge giving a different perspective, shifting people's perspective, and then creating new narratives that will help them go forward and create new beliefs. Um, Because, you know, we're intrinsically negatively biased as as individuals, as humans. And um, if we have a belief, um, you know, if we have a belief that, I can't think of example right now, but any belief we have, we, we look for confirmation of that belief. And so if it's a, a limiting belief or a, a, you know, a small belief, you will look for confirmation that that's going to happen. You, know, you wake up in the morning and believe it's going to be a terrible day today. That's like a limiting belief. Yeah. Um, and you will, your, your body, your system, your psyche will look for confirmation that's terrible. Oh, stop my toe. Oh, we run out of milk. And, and the whole day you'd be a catalogue. Because you'll be, you'll be seeking for this confirmation. Yeah. However, you wake up with a, conf- a belief of it's all going to go well. So I'm not talking about law of attraction or any of that sort of stuff. I'm just generally when you set all that setting your intent and, and setting your antenna in the morning. And go, oh, it's going to be a really good day. Really looking forward to it. Or I'm looking really looking forward to the meeting with so and so today with Damien. Really looking to have a good conversation today. And I'll get confirmation on the way because that's why I'm looking for the good stuff. And I'll confirm that belief as I go. So it's the same thing, really, same principle. So we, we look for confirmation. And so just make sure that those beliefs align to what you want to achieve. So it's a, being aware of your own narrative. And if that narrative is not serving you, changing is that that's what you're talking about? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and you talked. So you, about- you said in about three or four words, and I spent about I don't know hundreds of words. <laughs> I think you had a lot better examples than mine. <laughs> but I'm I'm because ref- uh, you talk about with that, if I understand correctly, you talk about visualization to do that. Is that part of you know part of rewriting that narrative? How, how to use visualization to create success? When you talk about what is visualization, why visualization is is important, and and how does it work? Do you want to talk through those? That well, that topic of visualization and those three points, and just explain that. Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, visualization. You know, we know a lot of um, elite athletes will do this, um, but it's not just for elite athletes. Uh, more and more, 
uh, business people are looking at. Uh, and you know, there's there's a it's an interesting one because I think people forget uh, how powerful visualizers on there and it's not just the visualization at the end of a race or visualizing goals and they're important um but there's there's also um and i thought why why it works why, why visualization does work is we have a um a part of our brain the midbrain called um it's called the ras the reticular activating system and it's, it's basically a filter yep. uh, you know we've got millions of sensory input coming into our brain the brain just can't handle it so it filters and it filters according to what you set it and and if you visualize something it will filter according to that visualization of what you want to achieve and the same with the te- intent that's why intent's important if you intend to do something you intend you're setting that filter uh, so it's quite important and it works on the same principle with visualization um, but I, I use visualization a lot for helping individuals or teams uh, navigate um, um, other challenges or uh, processes that they're working through um, and to try and spot things that they've never realized before. Um, you know, you know, if you go back to, you know, Michael Phelps is, is a great one who sort of talks about a visualization um, and he has, I think it was these, it was, he did a, I mean, it's 400 meter, fly he, he got a gold medal for it um got the fastest time as well world record um but people didn't realize in the last sort of quarter of the actual race um he was uh, his goggles were filled up with water so he couldn't actually see where he was going and yet he still managed to um achieve a, a gold medal and a world record which is like how on earth did he do that um goggles uh, because he, he was going so fast <laughs> Well, yeah, but part of, his, part of his visualization, it's not just about visualization of the winning line. He used what we call that almost process visualization, where you visualize things that could go wrong. Um, and so you, you he visualize his goggles filling with water or his, his suit tearing, whatever he, he thinks of the opportunities that could go wrong. And so you when you visualize things, you, you, you effectively are taking your, if you do it properly, you're taking your whole body and your whole system through it as though you're there. Yeah. Um, it's just the same. And it it's incredible because then he, he, he then, when when it does happen, A, you don't get surprised because you think, oh, visual, I've been there. I've, I've already done this because you've visualized it. Yes. But when you visualize those things, say, okay, when that happens, what am I going to do to mitigate it? And therefore, he would have whatever he does would have, so then he goes from being calm and relaxed and then suddenly he's he's then mitigating and that's really useful and i use it a lot for like when people are presenting and stuff you know not just visualizing it's all going to go well but actually visualizing things that could you know you could have a heckler you could technology go wrong wherever it may be you think about it and then you go okay if that happens what what would i do this is what i do so when it does happen you just slick into it and it's really quite a powerful tool uh, for that. Uh, so I do that with my clients where appropriate. Um, and say so it's not just about the goal bits, it's sometimes the process bits and looking at ways of, you know, mitigating stuff. And I, and I did it with, um, I did it, I was working with a team of rowers who were, who were looking to break a world record to row around Great Britain. And we did some visualization on, I think it was putting out a, a power anchor, uh, helps them to sort of stabilize the, the boat when, when they're in sort of, um, um and storms and they all visualized it as a team and then i got them to share some insights they got from that in terms of what things went wrong and what would they do and they all start to share different things and it became quite a powerful thing they said oh well when i put it out i was thinking this could go wrong and that could go wrong and they said, oh, i never thought about that and then suddenly the whole team started to learn from each other's visualization and it became a really helpful tool then for a to put into a place going forward so it's a good way of of, of mapping out things like that as well so really powerful uh, and it does work as well so that's process visualization um so you use that to if i understand you're using that to go through things that could go wrong and 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 like as a team identify different areas that you need that you could use to to strengthen that you also talked about um outcome visualization how's outcome visualization different from process visualization and where would you use that that's more about when you're setting out to i don't know 
run a marathon or you've got a big goal to achieve in your business and that's sort of visualizing or to win a race and it's just focused very much on the, the outcome itself and therefore you you're what you're doing you're setting this this ras in your brain to bring you everything you need to accomplish that along the way as in what you need to see what you need to be aware of so you achieve it um and that's what you you're doing so if you're setting out to do a marathon for example and you're very focused on it you visualize it you know daily as you're doing your training then you'll um a it'll, it'll motivate you uh, b it'll bring all the things you need to know whether you see stuff online about or read stuff or bump into people talk about how people help you in terms of input into your training to your diet what you eat it does everything it starts to uh, create um, that filter set for you so you you basically consume everything you need to deliver on that um, uh, outcome so that's what it does right and I, and, for, and I must apologize to our viewers as well I think I've got this the wrong way around because you talk about three types of visualization now I think I understand what the first one is is clarity visualization correct me if I'm wrong and can you explain it a bit for but it, it seems to be clarity would be getting clear about what your goals are and then you'd move to outcome and then you move to process is that it, 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 it's not always doesn't always move that way but uh depending on where you go i mean the clarity piece is you know and often my clients come and want clarity on what next where they're going what needs to happen um and often i you know this is where i will say to them i almost put them out sometimes five ten years i get them to think about their you know you know what what can they see what they can they they feel what can they hear so it's, it's using all the senses visualization is not just by sight by the way it's it's using all the senses even what you can taste um and so i get them to sort of almost pan out in 10 years time what do you see feel and hear and then i bring them back to five years and i slowly get them back to the sort of you know one month out and suddenly we you get this form of something that was quite vague in the future or very big and then an absolute clarity comes when they get closer and then they go, okay, I know what I need to do now in the next month to get close to that big goal now in, in 10 years time. And so, and that was a little bit what I did with that client who went from 50 to hundred million. Um, it was very much that panning out a bit. I, I pushed him further out than he'd gone before, which then created this bigger view that he'd not realized before. And so he saw something different. Um, so that's what that sort of, and it gives you that clarity then. So there isn't a really a set order that you should go through those visualizations, but they are for different no. purposes. Is that yeah? So what, that's right. Yeah. So clarity visualization is is to get clear about where you're going. Um, process is to understand the the elements that that could go um, wrong and, and work through that. And outcome is to to get um, to understand the outcome the, and set your RAS so that it's focused. That's on right. That. Yep. Cool. I learned something today. This is really great. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um the other thing i noticed that you talk about a lot is procrastination and you talk about what is procrastination and why do we procrastinate and how to overcome that do you want to and i'm sure you know our listeners and um would ex a lot of people would experience that where you know we set a goal and and i, I believe i read a statistic somewhere that the the most people will set a goal and then won't even attempt to achieve um so what, what causes that procrastination and, and how can someone overcome that? Yes, we, I think we all do it. Um, we all get, fall into it. Um, and it, it comes, comes back to internal motivation, comes back to um, setting goals that are, are appropriate. Uh, I think often we set things that are either what we ought to set, as in by what society or what our boss thinks we should set, or we're told these are the things you have to do. Yeah. Um, and we'll do anything not to do things like that because it just, just doesn't, it's not intrinsically linked to our motivation and to who we are and what we're about, then we won't do it, um, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's also a thing of if there's no consequence, because sometimes it's interesting because consequence can be a motivator. That sounds quite negative. But actually, when you're if, if there's a consequence of not doing something, you'll do it. Yeah. Um, so sometimes, sometimes it's good to sort of flip things, and I, sometimes I bring that to a client to sort of flip them. Well, if you don't do, what's going to happen? Well, I won't get paid. Okay, and well, then that gives a motivation to do it. So yeah. that's one way. But um, but 
for me, it goes back to, you know, getting back to this purpose piece. It's getting back to uh, ensuring that you encapsulate and put anything in place for a goal into purpose. Know your purpose, your big thing, your why, whatever you want to call it. Um, and then if a goal's linked to that, then it's intrinsically linked to energy, motivation, because it will get you closer to your purpose. Uh, and that's for me is one of the steps of creating that sort of motivation and, and going against sort of procrastination. Uh, so I think often people, they're not aligned to that. And it goes back to a business as well. Make sure, you know, if you've got a purpose as a business, that everything that, that anybody's doing, role, the, their objectives, they've got, it's all linked to that because uh, then people feel part of something bigger. Uh, and that's the important thing is making sure that the goal you're going to do of, you know, phone these people, it's not just to transactionally get more money or have a conversation, it's actually to be, um, get me closer to my goal of doing what X, Y, Z, you know, I go to networking events, not to sell my wares, not to, so I can make lots of business contacts. I go there to help people uh, and to inspire people, have impacts, uh, try and unlock people's potential. That, that's my motive. And so when I have conversation, that's what I end up talking about. And then they go, oh, what do you do? Oh, I'm, I do this. And and I may get into conversation and they might want to employ me. But I don't go there just to win new business because that's quite very short-term, very transactional. It's actually, I go for a bigger purpose and people will feel that. And that motivates me as well when I'm there thinking, when I go away, actually, I achieve I got close to my purpose today. I didn't win clients, I didn't win any business, but that's not what it's all about. It's not more than that. It's far more than that. It's me having an impact and unlocking people's potential. If I had a conversation <clears throat> and unlocked some the little shift in somebody's mindset, I got close to my purpose impacting people. And so the purpose seems to be like that big driving factor to overcoming crap purpose in a stick by the sounds of it and knowing the consequence of not doing it but also <laughs> working toward being clear about your purpose and, and coming to the four uh, key areas that you help people we talked about clarity of vision and, and uh, knowing your values which relates to the purpose how does someone find their values what what can they do or how do they identify what their values might be if they don't know them yes um it can be quite a, a challenge sometimes and i think it's often just you know, taking some time out to find out what really matters to you and what resonates with you and you know, do that in a context of where, whether that's going for a walk, sitting at a beat, whatever it is where you, where you think, reflect and starting to, I guess, think about what, what you like in, in terms of your, your values, what are those integrity, you know, uh, how you care for people, whatever it may be, just start, ra- start writing words down and things that come to your mind. Don't get too caught up on the list. Just, just I think just, just write a whole thing, load things down. Um, and then think about the people that you have good relationships with um, and have long standing relationships and deep relationships with and think about what, are, what do you think their values are? Because often we tend to attract similar type of people uh, with us in terms of talking about deep relationships. Uh, not always, but uh, there'll be elements, of, oh, yeah, they're, they're really quite helpful, aren't they? And they've got real kindness about them. And 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 so just, you know, five, six people write down what you think their values are. Um, and then you could then ask those people close to you, those are sort of close advisors or somebody slightly outside of that, to think what they think your values could be. What, what, do you, what behaviours are you displaying? that are observing that could be your values. And so you end up with like almost like three sort of lists of words, phrases, and then you start to, you'll start to see some patterns and start to see some things that resonate with you more. And, and, that, and that starts to create that form of your, your values. Because uh, they're there, they're just, you just need to become explicit rather than being implicit. Uh, so that's quite a helpful exercise. And that can be, and just take your time and just mull over things uh, and that things pop up and think, oh yeah, that, 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 I really, integrity is really important to me. And I like those people around me who've got a lot of integrity and and people might say, yeah, yeah, I think you've got a lot of integrity. And and so that starts to then create a pattern thing. Okay, that's one of my values. Um, so yeah. Wow. I know we're running a bit short of time and you're a busy man and you've got some appointments to go to shortly. So we 
can you now now's the time of the show where I'd like you to to just tell people about you know this is your time to to pitch yourself and and offer your wares <laughs> tell people what you do and um and and how they can contact you do you want to just share that I know we'll put the details in the blog as well but can you just you know share that detail as well please yeah yeah sure I mean I, mean, I, I help um uh, individuals I help teams and organizations uh, I help athletes uh, do why well, I'd say do amazing things. Um, I, I love working with people and who've got great ambition. And I have that privilege of working with people, whether they want to grow a business to 100 million, which found, sounds outrageous, to going to breaking world records. I mean, and things in between that as well. So um, wonderful privilege of doing that. Um, I have an approach which is very focused on gaining clarity of your sense of purpose hence why you probably heard me saying a lot about clarity and a lot about purpose um which is vital to setting where you needed to go what what, what you're about uh, i help people really dial up that sort of self-awareness because i think if you're going to have impact you've got to know who you are and how you act and impact other people around you uh, and then finally it's then knocking down those limiting beliefs uh, and and with what i do is that's what i help smash down because uh, i think people have generally know what they want to do uh, they sort of know how to get there but it's a limiting belief that stops them actually acting upon that um, and so i help people become unstoppable uh, and be exceptional in what they do uh, but yeah so you can contact me obviously i have um through linkedin uh, you can look me up on there and through my website, which I'm sure the details will be in the show notes. Um, but I also host a, a podcast called Helping Organizations Thrive, which is all about leadership and resilience, uh, interviewing various people from around the world. Um, and uh, yeah, look forward to engaging with you. Beautiful. Yes. And we'll put all those details in the in the show notes for, for this podcast. Okay, we're, we're going to wrap it up shortly. But before we do, can we leave with... Uh, one or a couple of pieces of your key wisdoms that you'd like to share with the audience? <laughs> My key wisdoms. Um, I, I, I've said it before, and it's two things I use a lot is, you know, be really fully present with people and you'll get so, so far more out of people if you're you're absolutely fully there. Sounds really basic, sounds really obvious sometimes, but be mindfully fully present with people and um you know and also just ensure that you have other people around you that you can um have input uh, you know we we, we 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 develop by communities we develop by having those around us not just about coaching i'm talking about friends talking about uh, people in the same industry you know colleagues whatever you know have a good network around you uh, i found that really helpful but certainly when you're on your own you know business entrepreneur uh, having a good network is is vital for people to, to to lean on to chat to and just 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 moral support is vital beautiful thank you very much julian it's been a, such a pleasure having you on the show hopefully we can have you back sometime in the future to to continue the discussion Absolutely, Dave. I've loved it. Really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you for being part of the Share.Care community and helping people around the world prosper. You're creating a bigger pie for everyone to share. The more people contributing to the world being a better place, the better the world becomes for others and for you.